Welcome back to Making Money Matter, ladies and gentlemen. Just as we get started with the Gold Conference, I wanted to ask Peter Grandich to come back on the program. Last time, you all loved it. You said, get him back again soon. Sorry, it's been a few months. Peter had spent pretty much 40 years on Wall Street. He's a Wall Street veteran, but he's also very active on X. And I remember back, I think it was in 2022, he was saying to people, gold will outperform stocks and bonds as we go forward. And during that time, a lot of people poo-pooed what he was saying and said, oh, that's crazy, crazy talk. Well, maybe not so crazy because we know gold has been hitting all the time. And I said, look, it's not a nice place to be because gold does well when times are not that crash hot. And I think that's where we are at the moment. But Peter, welcome back to Making Money Matter. Great to see you. And I appreciate your time as well because I know how busy you are. Good to see you again. Same here, and I always enjoy speaking with you. Thanks, Peter. Well, look, as I said, we're just we're we've got the gold conference coming up, and uh, it's going to be a very busy time for precious metals. I just mentioned in the introduction there that uh, back in 2022, you said that gold and I suspect precious metals will outperform stocks and bonds. Uh, is that still your view today? As I talked to you at the coming up towards the end of August 2024. So as we ended 2021, as you correctly stated, I made a bold, and it was very bold at the time, uh, commentary that uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, don't need to go through, but bottom mm -hmm. line was, I thought for three years through 2024, gold would outperform both general equities and bonds. You know, it's funny, some people could understand the stocks, but they couldn't begin to believe that. How could bonds don't lose? That's that's what you were hearing then. Of course, the rates were one and two percent back then. And uh, but the bottom line is gold's up 37 percent from January 1st, 2022 to yesterday. And the stock market and s and up about 12 and 16 percent. And bonds actually lost money. Oh, really? So, yeah, the 10 year bond, which was yielding then about one point seven. It's yielding about 3.8 now. So it, it actually lost a uh, double dip percentage. And hearing the words bonds and losing is not what investors are normally used to hearing. And that's what actually compounded that call. But most people uh, uh, chose not to listen and, in fact, made fun of it, you know, and you know, actually questioned my uh, mental health to think that wow. something like that could work. Now, keep in mind, that was not done because I'm a, a tinfoil hat guy or anything. I was strictly saying for capital appreciation, if you're asking me what's going to outperform over the next three years, to me, clearly was gold. Now, it did, and three times is better. It's not as easy for gold to go up now as it did then, but all the things, Carrie, that were there to make the rise that we have are still there. That's why I don't think other than corrective phases, consolidation, profit taking, we have yet to see anything close to the heights of this. And the, the big part of it be carrying and what's great about because where you are in the world, people are at least somewhat focused on what I'm about to say. Wall Street continues to ignore the formation of the bricks and what is happening there and what they've missed with that is that that's one of the key reasons gold has risen because we've already heard from two or three of the key representatives, China, Russia, how they've already kind of talked and walked through a process that's going to include gold and how they work their trades and how they settle trading among themselves. And Wall Street just continues to ignore this and I, it was one thing when there was six countries, it was 11, but now with 50 formally asking to join and another amount of that informally inquiring and over 120 of them have now already talked about joining this new system to either work with the SWIFT or actually avoid the SWIFT system altogether, the Western world banking system. And I, I just, just befuddled, and I'm not surprised because... There's a there's a stigma on Wall Street. I've always coined it the "Don't worry, be happy" crowd. <laughs> I really, I carry. I really believe this. It's going to sound sarcastic, but I mean it sincerely. On my daughter's life, 
most financial advisors, so that means somewhere between 51% of them and 99%, could be tossed off the top of our Empire State Building. And all the way down, they'd all say the same thing. Hey, so far, so good. So they have this perpetual, always seeing the cup half full, never speak about negatives. Things are always going to work out. And that's why they themselves have missed this wonderful performance. And by the way, Kerry, it's not just three years of performance. Since the millennium started, gold yeah. has outperformed stocks and bonds. And now over the last 50 years, based on when gold started free trading till now versus bonds, it's outperformed bonds. It's unheard of. It's, it, it's unbelievable to think 30 or 40 years ago when I was started in the business, it was always treated as kryptonite gold. It really was. Okay. You never heard any general financial service firm, including gold in their portfolio. But even despite all this performance, we still find most people and most advisors having little or no ownership of gold. Do you think that's because they don't get any uh, income if they recommend gold? Absolutely. I'm glad you say that. They don't personally profit like they can from others. Also, the, the, the difficulty, I think, with it is because the main saying of their business is financial assets and will always be that, Yeah, it's very hard to expect. There may be times when they both move together. But normally, when gold goes up a lot, you know, financial assets probably didn't do as well and vice versa. And since this is their mainstay, it's like going to a, uh, I don't know what car dealers you have in Australia, but here, say, to a Chevy dealer, and that Chevy dealer knows in each type of model they have, they don't have the best ever. Ford has something better than them. But when that person comes in and asks for that type of model in lieu of saying, yeah, you should go down to the Ford guy because he's got a better make, they just sell them what they have. And that's how they treat their financial assets. That's why I don't ever expect to see gold until this i do think if i'm correct and there's others that are saying it that the BRICS will be using gold in in, in in a major way in fact the russian financial prime minister has already said they're expecting this unit that they're forming to be 40 percent gold yeah. i do think they see that and recognize that and how in, at least in your area of the world people are still are open to owning physical bullion we still see here in North America, Canada and the U.S., when you sit down and look at people's portfolios or you see the standard portfolio put out by a financial service firm, gold is nowhere to be found. I know. It's, I think it's less than 1% of people that, that own gold. I just wanted to go back to something that you said a moment ago, which you, you mentioned the word financial asset. How would you, how would you classify gold? It's not a financial asset. It's just interesting because you say that, you know, they, they deal in financial assets. So what is gold? The, the good news is it's nobody else's liability. Hmm. See, one of the things the finance, even this young financial advisors that I speak to today, who when I was just speaking not too long ago, Carrie, you get a kick out of this. I said, I'm going to speak about bricks and one young financial lean over to the other. Is he going to talk about the housing industry? I mean, oh. they didn't, he didn't even know what the bricks was. But wow. one, of the things, one of the things I don't think why that why that is the case is people don't understand how much leverage there is in the world, not just the debt that exists, which is out, but how many people have used that debt and leveraged themselves off of that debt. I mean, I saw one study that showed there may be as, uh, tw as many as a couple of dozen dominoes if one derivative falls how many people who have used that derivative in one way or another would be impacted by that uh, fall? That's why the, the the talk here in the U.S., and I don't know if it gets to Australia, is certain banks are too big to fail. They can't yep. let them fail. Well, yep. One of the major reasons is that is, is because of the derivative market, because That's the right. repercussions would be so enormous. And in a sense, I think the financial service firms, the big ones, take advantage of knowing that. And that's why they're so risk-taking. And then they get slapped in the hand when they've made billions and they give a couple hundred million back in fines because they know the governments really can't admonish them to the point of serious punishment because if they fall apart, the governments fall apart. 
So it's never so so my question on that one is if it's never going to fall apart, why should we worry? Because the governments are going to keep print, uh, you know, propping it up and printing, printing the what I, I don't call it money. I call it f uh, I don't know. I don't know what you call it, but the paper. But the empires all eventually fall apart, no matter what, throughout history. Just look back. You can go back be before Christ and look at all that, or you can look at the Romans. Look, at, Did anybody think in the 1800s Great Britain would not be the world power that it was at the time? Certainly up until a few years ago, most people thought the United States that way. I don't think they're anywhere near on the world stage where they were 20 or 30 years ago. The change is afoot. And so I don't think you could ever just say never. I do think to give credit where credit is due, the central banks have recognized what's going to be needed to be changed. Not It's interesting, Kerry. There has been serious talk finally, even outside of our little gold community, mm -hmm. by independent uh, uh, financial advisors about what's happening with gold. Finally, I mean, it took going, you know, basically doubling price. And they have talked and noted how much central banks have been buying gold. But the untold story in that part is how many central banks have repatriated their gold from the United States? Oh. It's a dozen. How many? And several dozen. Stay. I, I think it's 33, actually. I don't have the actual. Uh, I should have had the num the actual oh, number for okay. you. I think that's the number. And here's the interesting thing. This, this is big countries like Germany and all the small ones. Germany asked eight years ago, mm. and they still haven't gotten back their full amount. Now, my opinion is this. If I had ample, if I held everything I was supposed to hold as the United States of these people, what's the difficulty if they want to get it back? That goes back to the people that have argued for years, if not dozens of years, that the, 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 the goal that has been in Fort Knox or the, the banks have more than lent out uh, more times than the, even the existence of known gold. That's always been the argument that these uh, bullion banks have really been depressing the metals price because they should be able to get their gold back. What, you know, how long does it take to move it from there to there? Yet they're still taking years to fully get back, you know, the amount of the gold. And then the, the $64 million question is, why are they repatriating their gold? Why have all these countries decided to go to the United States and say, because they recognized the change of a foot and how the days is numbered for the U.S. dollar, the SWIFT system, and the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was the Ukrainian-Russia war, When not only when we froze Russian assets, but now we've taken the dividends that they've earned and given them to the Ukraines. And anybody that's been dealing with the United States would have to say, what stops them from doing that to us? Yeah. Yeah, once you weaponize uh, a currency, everybody starts to, to to wonder if it could happen to you as well. Absolutely. And look, look, even on a smaller scale, I think the Ukrainian thing is much bigger, but even look how the United States left Afghanistan and literally left its allies to fend for themselves. Mm -hmm. They had to get out on their own. There was, you know, so there was, there's a, I try to tell American investors the young advisors don't have the years to want to listen to this. I keep trying to tell people the world stage is changing. It changes every several hundred years and all. It, the United States and Canada, you know, what used to be the two biggest trading partners and all. Now each one would trade their leader and think they got the short end of the stick. That's how bad each country is going. But the bottom line is we're seeing the change and the change has moved to your area of the world, not obviously Australia, but Asia and primarily China. And this formation of the BRICS, if you think about it, even it ends up only being 50 or 75 or more countries. These are countries that are going to primarily purpose trade among themselves without the United States participating or being using their monetary system. And I say to these financial advisors, how does that help the United States? If 20 years ago they were trading with us and now they're primarily not trading with us, how could that be bullish for the United States? And I get one of these, ha, 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 and I don't get an answer. But uh, that that I, I still think the BRICS story, to me, is going to be as important to world commerce. When it's all said and done, it's probably at least three to five years, maybe even seven or more before it's fully implemented. 
But I think it's going to have as much of an impact on world commerce as when the Industrial Revolution came about and how that built up world trade. And America is outside looking in. Well, my, my question there is, do you think that the U U.S. could stop BRICS in one way, shape or another? In other words, could they put pressure on somebody like Saudi Arabia or um, the UAE or, or some of these countries that want to join and say, do you know what, if you join, we're going to do this to you? In other words, can the U.S. stop the advancement of the BRICS nations and, and have it start to fall apart and get a bit weaker? One of the many things I like about you, you're even good when you may not even be aware that you're good because that Saudi Arabia is the perfect example. Look mm. what happened a few years ago in the Biden administration. Our oil prices were going up. Gasoline was going up. America was kicking up because our transitory inflation turned out to be a lot more than just transitory. Mm. Biden goes over there almost in a sense like an old bully who has already had one too many fights and lost his steam. And from that moment on, the Saudis flipped completely and they decided that they were no longer going to be tied just to the United States. They began to note that they were going to accept other currencies and also not renew the old petrodollar understanding and agreement. And with that, the United States lost leverage that it, it, it had at one time in the Middle East. And you can go around the world and look at that at different sections of the world and the United States, uh, Uncle Sam is not welcomed in a lot of places. And that is uh, clearly going to accelerate depending on who wins the election. Yeah. One, one winner may forestall that. It may not deteriorate at the same level, but it's, it's already turned. It's, it's only a matter of when, not if. And... Uh, most Americans, again, I I'm shocked when I meet some serious institutional people still, and they have no inkling or understanding how geopolitics and world uh, commerce is being impacted by BRICS. They really, really have no comprehension of it. Well, talk to us about how you think it's going to impact uh, world commerce, the, the BRICS nations. Do you think that it will weaken the US dollar? Because the US dollar has you know, it's been the happy kid in the playground. And I I, I know I spoke to um, Brent Johnson many years ago of his dollar milkshake theory, which is pretty interesting. Uh, a stronger US dollar for much, much longer. What's your views on that? I mean, is, is, is it really going to, as you said, everything fails eventually, but I, I'm just not seeing it at the moment. Too big to fail. Well, Kerry, I, I, I'm going to respectively have a different view on that. Good. First of all, statistically, we've seen uh, as each year goes by a lessening of the dollar used as a reserve currency. Uh, it used to be in the 90s. It's, it was around 70 percent. Some people expect it'll be in the low 60s in the next year to two. Oh, wow. I, th I think the other thing, again, uh, when when people see the countries that will formally come together after this fall and we look at everything that they have energy reserves uh uh agricultural you know you're talking about people in the world who are going to be the dominant as a group far mm. bigger than the united states or even with it allies in food in uh energy critical minerals i mean critical minerals is basically china you know and most of us, including yours truly, until COVID, never knew how much the United States had moved away from producing and, and making its own stuff and had become solely dependent almost exclusively on China. Mm -hmm. And anybody thinks if China is going to be responsible for 80 or 90 percent of the critical minerals that we all need, that they're just going to amply supply us so we can build missiles to point at them. It's not going to happen. It's foolhardy. And uh, China has people can say what they want and they have their own issues. It's not an easy street that they're going down and all. But the bottom line is they have gone out and, and decided years ago that they are going to make sure that they're self-sufficient from all the things they need to run as a country. And they've been doing that while the United States was basically asleep at the switch. Wow. All right. So pulling it right back towards what you said back in 2022, 
And your intimation during this conversation was that gold has had its run. Now, I always say to people that gold will outperform inflation and during sticky inflationary times, you should have some exposure to gold. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, not financial advice. I don't know your own circumstances and we're not here to do that, but I'm always, I'm an investor with a curious mind and I want to find out from Peter what he thinks. And it's not a, a price prediction, Peter, but more, do you think people should, even if they haven't got exposure to precious metals at the moment, should be taking uh, taking notice right now? What I have stated is it'll be harder to double from here versus how it doubled from the 12 to 1300. I still think it can go a lot higher and a lot of it's going to have to do what happens and how fast things are implemented through the BRIC nations. But I've always stated in my entire career, and there were years when I didn't own gold, I didn't even know what the price was. You own gold because you want to hope it doesn't go up. And when I would sit with families and it's funny, Carrie, they almost did it exactly almost together. They go, excuse me, Ms. Granish, why would you want me to buy something that you hope doesn't go up? And I would tell them, because I'm looking at your portfolio here, which is all stocks and bonds. And if gold goes up, especially a lot, chances are this went down. So I like you to have a little bit of it over here as an insurance. I know you have home insurance. I know you have car insurance. Let's get some portfolio insurance. But Three years ago, I wanted to buy it because I felt from a capital appreciation standpoint, it was going to be the best performer. I still think it will outperform stocks and be close to bonds net net return. But I think what's taking over is the things related to gold and related to other metals, which is basically mining and exploring. Now the leverage that comes in mm. and that we have we've had such neglect on the uh develop exploration and development of metals worldwide mm -hmm. for a couple of decades now yeah and on the one hand we have this don't worry be happy crown on wall street that's telling everybody stock market's going to the moon ai what's well, true ai could be real big you know how much power they need for ai it's uh, it's un unbelievable how much electrical power is going to be needed to meet. We certainly don't even have the ability to deliver it right now. So I told people, and that's why some of the stocks were people that sell electrical goods, transmit transmitters and all that kind of stuff, their stocks are going up. But if you're going to have a belief of that, you're still going to believe the green argument. There's still going to be electric vehicles. China's certainly not giving up on that and so forth and so on. You need a bunch of metals. Yeah. And, and we not only have we not looked for them, it's much harder to find it, work in certain areas where 20, 30 years ago, we didn't worry about that. Now we do. And then, of course, the cost because of grades declining. You know, the copper grades on the world average have fallen by 50%. Mm -hmm. So you have to move twice as much or to get the same type of grade result that you used to get before. So my feeling is while the metal will go higher, I certainly believe, I'll tell you this much, we're going to have a three number in gold. We will, I do believe we'll hit 3,000 something. That's at least the target. My target used to be 2550 when we were 1200. So I think another 20% is, is reasonable as a target. But now the leverage of companies that look for it and mm -hmm. other type of metals is where the return comes because we've had such an increase in the price, but we've basically peaked in cost. So these producers, whether they're in Australia or Canada or the United States, Gold producers are going to see massive increases in free cash flow. And the yeah. other thing that's going to cause for them, they're going to use that to go shopping. They're not going to start find a first find a deposit, spend 10, 15 years developing it on their own. They're going to go look for guys that got it, gals that have it ready made. They can acquire uh, projects that are already in production or very advanced. And what's really interesting a couple of weeks ago, BHP, uh, along with the London Group, made an acquisition of a company that's still a few years away from developing their project. And it's going to take a few billion more, even though they've already spent it. But they were willing to pay for that. And that was a clear signal that companies are in real need now of major deposits, that they were willing to not only spend a couple of billion to get control of this, but then be willing to spend billions more to develop it. 
Was that and, was uh, that in copper or gold or or what? what yeah, it was base metals. I can't remember exactly how it's broken down in that company, but it was a phenomenal deposit. But we've seen others doing that already. And what I'm really liking in the last week or two, and forgive me, I don't follow the Australian market closely, okay. so I don't know. But what I'm seeing in North America now is they're stepping down to mid-tier producers mm -hmm. and emerging producers. Mm -hmm. And eventually, as hard as to imagine, because we've had a horrific bad junior resource market for a couple of years, they will step down to that level soon. And so as much as I still like gold, I like things related to it now more because the leverage there uh, comes into play. Really, and, and it's a really good point, Peter, because I think that, and, and interestingly enough, we've got a lot of companies that are coming to the Australian Gold Conference, uh, which is the 26th to the 28th of August, so imminent. Uh, we have a lot of the explorers, developers, not so many producers this year. Uh, they're probably too busy producing. Um, but we've got a great company called Alkane Resources, uh, got a Tommingley deposit that just keeps growing. Now, that I believe, and I, and I believe right across the board here in Australia, the, 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 the resource stocks have been battered. And that's why, as you say, quite rightly, it's the leverage. And that's what's getting you interested at the moment. So again, ladies and gentlemen, it's not financial advice, but here's an opportunity for you to go and meet these people face to face in Sydney in a commodity that Peter talks about that he says it's the leverage that's going to be interesting going forward. So it's time really to wake up and just start to get it. As I say to people all the time, Peter, I'm sure you do as well, you know, get yourself educated and understand where the opportunities are because I think the last time that we spoke, you said so many people in the US, and it's the same here in Australia, are living paycheck to paycheck. They just can't get off the hamster wheel. We have 65% of Americans working paycheck to paycheck. We have five issues before I go, I think, to critical to, to, to say them again, why I've talked about building this financial arc for the first time in my career to people. First, the debt issue is just insane now. We're 35 trillion. We're going up to... It's hard for me to use a T, okay? When I started, yeah, we, didn't even, we didn't even have one T. We didn't even have a trillion in debt. Now we have 35 trillion and we're doing two to three trillion dollar in deficit a year. We're going to get to a point in about five to seven years, we're going to be close to 50 trillion in debt. And the problem there is at a 5% interest rate, that's two and a half trillion in an interest expense. Right. Best we've ever done a couple of years ago as a country in revenue was five trillion three hundred billion. So kick that up even we go to six trillion in revenue. We're going to see almost half of our funds have to go pay for our interest. Just interest. Just interest. So from the military on down, all sorts of services that we've gotten used to the government providing will be cut or gone away with and taxes are only going to go up now listen right now we're having this convention here the democrats the republicans had them and people kicking up because the democrats are talking about raising taxes a lot and i'm not a democrat i'm a strong republican but you want to know something they're correct we're going to have to raise taxes you can't keep having deficits governments can only do two things they can raise taxes or they can cut services and they're going to have to do both now and I, they're not going to be alone. I think, you know, Japan is another case example that's, you know, that's so indebted and so forth. And then the other shrinking part of that is, and it goes into the aging crisis, which the retirement and aging crisis is my second pro, uh, crisis, I believe we're in, is demographics. Less people, more less people to pay for the older people that still need to, the boomers still have several years in front of them. The third is immigration. God, that's a worldwide problem. Uh, it, it's it's so expensive. I'm not talking anything about the political or terrorism or anything of that nature, just the cost, because most people, most of them are coming with their shirts in the back. So they're going to be a liability for quite a while. I'm sure some will come to work. I'm sure some will turn out to be good workers and build families like past immigration. But the vast majority that are coming in these waves that in Europe and U.S. and Canada are coming basically with their shirts on their back. And so there's a big cost for that at a time we can't afford it. The fourth is the BRICS, and maybe carry our clothes with this. The fifth is the biggest problem in America, and it's the one we would hope that can fix the others, 
and it's the most broken of them all, and that's political paralysis. Our two parties, the Democrats and Republicans, can't even go in the same room anymore, let right. alone let alone begin to have to make hard decisions and political changes that are going to be necessary. Uh, and the sooner they do it, the better. But worse than that is they each have a splintering in their own parties. In the Democrats, they're moving more left and Republicans are moving more right. And there is not a wimp. There's not even a vague little voice of anybody on either side right now that's talking about balancing our books, getting our houses in order. So the typical question I get from America investors, what should I do? And I tell them, start in your own home. Less is more. Work the positive cash flow. You and I've had this talk before. Lower or eliminate debt if possible. Put your own house in order that you would be less dependent on how other people are going to be on the government because the government's going to come to you because you're going to still have something because more and more people are going to need something. So become self-efficient and protect as much as you can of what you have. And it doesn't matter really where you are in the world. I think any Western world country is going to try to do the same thing. It's going to take from the middle and upper middle class. The rich become so rich, they have ways to avoid it. And the poor don't have anything to give. And so more and more of that middle ground will be squeezed as each year goes by. Totally agree with you. And as, as they say, when you're getting on an aeroplane, put your own oxygen mask on first. And as you say, get your own house in order first. Last, last uh, if I can ask you for three pieces of advice, as I always do, Peter, that you would suggest to those that are watching right now here. A lot of my, my, um, my audience is here in Australia, but we do have international as well. Uh, I guess the first piece of advice would be put your own house in order first. But what would you say? Three pieces of advice. Yeah, less is more. I think you have to live in a positive cash flow. You don't need to have the biggest home or the biggest car. You just need a home that keeps you warm in the winter and hopefully cool in the summer. I think the other thing to recognize now, this is very critical. I've changed my ways since March. Capital preservation now takes precedent over capital appreciation. Okay. Focus more on preserving what you have versus trying to turn what you have into more. The markets are not going to be anywhere as easy as they were in the last few decades because the governments are not going to be in a way that they can just keep issuing to five or 10 or 20 trillion here and you know have all this money sloshing around. We're seeing the tail end of the bubble. I believe it'll be looked back. It's in something called Bitcoin. Uh, cryptocurrency to me is the single largest uh, hyped investment product in the history of mankind. I think tulips are even are jealous of them. And they're part of the final stage of where people are willing to believe anything and bet on anything if, it, if, if they're told it has a lot of chance of making a lot of money. And therefore, I think you should be doing the opposite and you should be a much more conservative. And always remember that there's bulls, there's bears, and there's pigs. The bulls and bears will each have their days, but the pigs always end up going to the slaughterhouse. Wow, what an interesting way to end, ladies and gentlemen. So think about it. Are you a bull, a bear, or a pig? Don't be a pig in many ways. Don't be a pig in your life, and don't be a pig with your money. Peter Grandish, as always, fantastic to see you. Let's have a chat again before the end of the year, because as always, your wise counsel is very welcomed by myself and all of our listeners out there. So for now, bless you. Thank you so much for coming on today. Well, Carrie, I hope you have a phenomenal show and I'm going to surprise you when I say this, but it's my hope, God willing, that your next year's show will not only be more successful, but I'll be standing at it. I certainly hope so. I'm excited for that, ladies and gentlemen. If you'd like to, to see Peter in person at the show next year, pop your comments below, share this uh, widely, and make sure you hit the subscribe button and tell others to watch Peter and follow him on X. But for now, Peter, great to see you. See you again soon. Cheers.